In this world, all is folly that is not pleasure. Let's drink out of the beautiful, the beautiful cup, the Tazabella of life. Welcome to the uh, the cup runneth over. Um, we're in the dream state. We're chilling with Sandman doing kratom and research chemicals. Um, it's making our dreams real weird. I just got back from the dream world or Hades hell, hell. I think that's where Sandman, I think that's honestly where he spent a majority of his time in the comics. Uh, but so it's, it was more like a purgatory. If you can imagine like the big Lebowski, I think there was a guy called, I think there was a guy called the Little Lebowski for some reason. Um, we're in a parking lot, giant parking lot, Disney World sized parking lot. And I'm just like, where is the car? Where's the car at, man? Where did I, where did I park my vehicle? I'm not really sure where I parked my vehicle. Anyway, we're doing um, a simulated experience of social interaction today. Uh, the Dream Realm, Dunk Tank, uh, Beverage, Wires, or Orgone. Also Orgone. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some movies today. Um, I was thinking about going on some weird rant about, uh, well, basically like irony and irony poisoning, but I don't really know what my point is with that. I do have some entertaining stuff to talk about, um, plenty to talk about with these movies. I've seen Godfather now. I've seen... There's not a lot besides, um, I mean, back in the day, I saw Casablanca and uh, the uh, the other one, the Rosebud one, just by his action as the traction magnets on the run. That guy, you know, the uh, Jeff Bezos, um, but he's just like a guy. He's just like a civilian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Alien and Godfather are in the bag. And then there's like Scarface and maybe the other essential film that I haven't seen besides maybe the second Godfather now is, uh, I just had it. I was just thinking of it. Um, what is it? Scarface and Metro- not Metropolis. Metropolis might be on that list. Um, 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 oh yeah, Evil Dead. I feel like a lot. Evil Dead might be more of like a film buff uh, thing, like the original one. But it's it feels like historic. I'm I'm getting all these horror movies on lock too. Uh, watching them uh, on the Twitch channel and stuff. Uh, so I've seen now Friday the Thirteenth and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's it's incredible that I, I don't know. A lot of movies are fucked up, and I don't even, I don't know if maybe one or, one or both of my parents had some sort of like Puritan reason, but my dad showed me, I mean, I saw, um, what was it, Very Bad Things, which I was just talking about the other day. Um... I saw Clockwork Orange when I was over at my friend's place. I was like 16 something. That's not, I mean, whatever. But he was like, yo, when I first saw this movie, I was 11. That's fucked up. And I was like, yeah, that is fucked up, actually. But um, I don't know. I guess I saw some cool movies when I was a kid. Waterworld. I love Waterworld 
for some reason. I saw it. I saw it early on. Watched a lot of Land Before Time. My parents had good taste, but sometimes I wish that I had seen more of these like kind of Shakespearean style movies, like Godfather. You know what I mean? Um, Metropolis might be on there. Nosferatu is a historic one, and that was great. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to talk about irony poisoning, but it's it's just a thing that's been on my mind lately. Um, it's something, honestly, I might be guilty of in the past, but I'm getting really sick of it. I'm getting really sick of other people. I'm not going to even name names or get into it, but uh, I'm so sick of other people who are... Oh, yeah, so this is, this is basically, in a nutshell, <clears throat> there's a few podcasts that I really like. And uh, I'm down. I'm down with with Brace Belden and Liz Franzak. If you know, you know. Um, and in my parasocial interest uh, with this guy, Brace said something really interesting lately, and it was this. He said, uh, "I kind of, sort of believe." That you can like say, you can cross boundaries and say controversial stuff if you're if you're really funny, you know. And but the thing is, like, eighty to ninety five percent of people who like try to do that stuff are just they're actually not funny. And uh, even the people, even some of the people who are funny, uh, I still question honestly. Um. And that's a weird, that's a weird place to be in. Uh, irony poisoned blue comedy, or what do you call it? Blue humor, black. Per- I I invented something called purple humor. I don't know if I mentioned it on the podcast before. Uh, with one of my with one of my favorite chatters, <laughs> but yeah, we're about the we're about the purple humor, not blue humor. I want to talk about okay so what we got what we got today is uh there's a whole um list of wikipedia articles wait butt fumble the butt fumble okay i'm getting ahead of myself here there's a whole list of wikipedia articles that are just um unusual articles and the first one that i found is uh sports and I didn't even notice that there's there's a parent page that has like subcategories here. There's animals and sports, athletes, sports team associations, games and strategy contests. But let's just let's just get to the butt fumble. What's this? Notorious American football player from National Football League playing on Thanksgiving Day, November twenty twelve. Jets and Patriots in front of home crowd 79,000 Jets quarterback Mark Sanchez collided with the buttocks of his teammate offensive lineman (laughs) causing a fumble which was then recovered by the Patriots safety Steve Gregory and returned for a touchdown touchdown play was the centerpiece of a disastrous sequence in the center quarter where the Jets lost three fumbles the butt fumble, the cursed butt fumble. So yeah, so this is just full of uh, full of stuff like this. And what have we got? This one is really interesting. So there's a rich, uh, there is a rich tradition of go playing. I don't know. May, I guess maybe for entertainment. Um, this was in Japan. It is a Jap. Is it a Japanese game? Uh, this was way back in 1835, and it's known as the blood vomiting game of Go. <clears throat> so basically, long story short, these two guys who were rivals. Uh, one of them was a prodigy of another guy and got promoted to a title in competitive Go called the Eight Dan. Uh, it's like an, a tier of players 
and so this guy who had already been in that uh association of players was like not messing with this other guy for a while because he was like eyes green and he got he got his whole uh position in this this new league um at, through intrigue right like he's not actually a good player he's not worth my time so after like years or was it six months or six years of dodging it um the younger guy named Akab- akaboshi was only 25 years old and the other guy was uh, Hon Ibo Joa, and he played white. <laughs> so anyway, they played for three days straight. Where is it? Um, the match lasted for four days without any adjournments. Joa won ma- won the match. Uh, the senior guy. And while kneeling over the board, Akaboshi in Tetsu, the younger guy, coughed up or vomited blood, according to who you ask, apparently. He died within a few months. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess sitting for four days straight? Uh, how? How? First of all, I mean, I've been, I've even, even experimenting with, with stimulants. I mean, it had to have been some kind of stimulants. How do you stay up for four days straight? That one, that one, I don't get, let's see what else. I don't want to focus on like. East like East Asia too terribly much, but there's an article called "The List of Games That Buddha Would Not Play," and um, he said that his disciples should likewise not play these games because he believed them to be a cause for negligence. I think that may, might just mean it's like a waste of time. I'm not sure, but uh, one of the number one on this list is games on boards with eight or. 10 rows um, is thought to refer to the Ash Ashtapada and Da Sapada respectively these are this shows two different manda- oh, Indian board game hmm okay but what's the reasoning okay these refer to these boards also being used with games involving dice so games of marking diagrams on the floor such that the player can only walk on certain places. Same game played in imaginary boards. That's referring to the first one. Games where players either remove pieces from a pile or add pieces to it with the loser being the one who causes the heap to shake. To shake. <clears throat> and that's like um, pick up sticks or Jenga, I guess. Some ancient equivalent. Number seven on this list is ball games. <laughs> Okay, uh, blowing through a pat kulai, a toy pipe made of leaves, plowing with a toy plow, playing with toy windmills, playing with toy measures, playing with toy carts, playing with toy bows. So <laughs> the Guatemala Buddha is what the the uh, the risen. The Risen Buddha, the second one. That's wild. Um, this one's fun, and this is uh, another American football one. And it's just referred to as the play. This was in 1982, the quote-unquote big game, Stanford versus California. I think the big game must refer... That must be like one of these regional cups. Like we have... Um, the Apple Cup, um, which is a competition between these two college football teams in Washington. Um, so the play was last game, last second game winning kickoff return for a touchdown. 
that occurred during a college football game. Now, the confusing thing about this is the whole thing with ladder. I don't, I don't really know football rules too much, but I think there might be like a limit to how far backwards you can, um, like throw the ball when you're doing, um, lateral passes. So basically what happened is the band, um, like the marching band or whatever came onto the field midway through the return. Um, which was a, an interception of a kickoff, I believe. Is that right? Let me see. Oh, Stanford are taking a 29 lead on a field goal with four seconds left. The Golden Bears used five lateral passes in this ensuing kickoff to return the score, the winning touchdown in the game's final seconds and earn a believe in the game. Oh, okay. So it was the kickoff after another kickoff. For some reason, the band got confused and people questioned the legality of the winning play, which I thought I, when I first read this, I thought it was an interception on like a, uh, an extra point kick, kick down. I, I do know a little bit about, I, I know the basic rules of football. I've watched a game or two. You can't be a fair weather Seattle Seahawks fan without, uh, without watching a game or two. I just, I much prefer basketball. If I'm going to watch competitive sports, NBA is really good. Um, I would be pretty into uh, college basketball, but it's just too, there's too many teams, too complex. <clears throat> okay, next one that I had opened already is something called the Robo Cup. Sorry. Um, RoboCup is an annual international robotics competition founded in 1996 by a group of university professors. Her 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 Hiroaki Kitano, um, who is, uh, head of systems biology Institute, president and CEO of Sony computer science laboratories. Oh, so yeah. Okay. So this, that explains it was Osimo. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Osimo. This is so interesting. They have a special ball. It's a special red ball. The Robo cup is, um, a ro a robot soccer game or yeah. Robotics competition. So the, but the goal of it is to, um, defeat the world cup FIFA by the middle of the 21st century, a team of fully autonomous humanoid robot soccer, soccer players shall win a soccer game complying with the official rules of FIFA against the winner of the most recent world cup. I don't know how they're going to convince the winner of the most recent world cup to play a bunch of robots. Uh, the, uh, the main thing I would think is, um, that it, the safety concerns would be the main concern. <clears throat> oh, they're going crazy outside. So there was a guy up next on our list. There was a guy called R he, R Hikion, also spelled R Hakion. Arikion, Arakion of Figalia it was a, ch a champion, uh, pan pan pancreatist, pancreatist in the ancient Olympic Games. He died while successfully defending his championship in the Panktration at the 54th Olympiad, 564 BC. He has been described as the most famous of all pancreatists. <laughs> I want to say like, wait, they had, they had pancreatitis? What was wrong with their pancreases? I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry for your pancreas. Um, uh, pancreation is a, uh, what do you call it? Unarmed combat sport. Pancration. Ancient Greek MMA, basically. All right, what do we got on this list? What do we got on this list? After, before we get to the uh, before we get to the films, Disco Demolition Night. Oh, this is famous. This is famous racism right here. Very important. Very important racism to learn about. I'm joking, but I'm also serious. Um, so, Death to Disco Movement was low key kind of like like racist. I don't know. I learned that once in school. They taught me it, but no, for real. Um, it's wild how much more, uh, I don't know, interesting dance music we would have if not for a bunch of like actual white supremacists from like the 13, like New England and the Midwest. It all coalesced on that night where a bunch of people just brought yeah they burnt they burned the records folks they literally burned books but with uh you know music music recordings so there's a real life quidditch that sounds lame as fuck uh ski ballet skiers doing flips and spins on a slope uh spogomi Oh, yeah, I wanted to see this, actually. It says, a sport where teams have to collect as much litter as possible. In the actual uh, parent page for these, there's a nice little stub of information that isn't included on the page itself. Uh, sport picking up trash. Oh, this is from Japan as well. It's a sport invented in Japan in which teams collect garbage and litter within a time limit and specified area. Invented in 2008, the first Spogomi World Cup was held in Japan in November 2023. <clears throat> I don't know why, but for some reason, this kind of reminds me of the game of uh, Money Wad. Uh, it was on, speaking of podcasts, um, it was on a podcast where Phil Elvrum explained it. It was a game that was often played by him and his friends um and it has simple rules I'll, ex I'll explain what i'm talking about um money wad everybody puts money into a wad and then there's like a designated wad holder or something um or maybe you just like put the wad like in the room or something and uh you keep adding money to the wad, but nobody can see like how much money is going in uh, when it does. And like the more people that play, the more confusing it gets. But the winner of the game gets the entire wad. And the way you win is to guess how much money is in the wad. So it's like, this is an interesting one with almost like a geocaching quality to it, where it's like, depending on where you're at, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. What if you, what if you hooked up this game to online servers of like something like Twitch streamers doing IRL, right? With the backpacks and the, the, uh, what do you call it? Gimbals. Gimbals are cool, by the way. Um, anything, anything with a gyroscope is cool. You could, you could hook it up to like an online competition and then you can get an advantage based on where you're at. You can just travel to a city with a lot of trash. And then, I don't know, maybe, maybe the government pays you. Um, maybe the government pays you, maybe, I don't know, maybe they need that for the parole people. I don't know. This is why I'm not in civics. 
it's boring it's boring besides in these parts civics is all about one thing governance is all about one thing and that is damn there sure are a lot of people moving to washington state on the west side of the mountains what the fuck do we do about this extreme ironing Oh, this looks hilarious. Some of these are literally just jokes. Just complete jokes. Extreme ironing is an extreme sport in which people take ironing boards to remote locations and iron items of clothing. According to the Extreme Ironing Bureau, extreme ironing is the largest danger sport that combines the thrills of an extreme outdoor activity with the satisfaction of a well-pressed shirt. Hey, why does it have to be shirts? See, my whole thing about extreme ironing, why does it got to be shirts? There was something in here that reminded me of Calvin Ball. What was it? What was it? It was something ball. Was it RoboCup? Stool Ball. What is Stool Ball? This is going to be the last one. Then we're going to talk about Sofia Coppola. Well, I mean, I don't know too much about Sofia Coppola. I do love her work. Some of it that I know about, um, and Godfather and Sonatine, but stool ball what the, f what the heck is this crap? First played in 1500, 523 years ago as a sport that dates back to at least the 15th century originating in Sussex. It's considered a traditional striking and fielding sport and maybe an ancestor of cricket. A game that resembles, in some respects, baseball, softball, and rounders. Rounders, I thought, was a movie starring Matt Damon about poker. Wow, rounders is a bat and ball game. Interesting. Interesting. Gameplay centers on a number of innings in which teams alternate at batting and fielding. Points known as rounders are scored by the batting team when one of their players completes a circuit past four bases without being put out. This is exactly baseball. This is just baseball. That's so weird. So rounders... <clears throat> when... What? Tudor times. So when did cricket get invented? Just a second here. Just a second. Do 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 do. Wait, where's cricket? Cricket. Cricket was invented. Sixteenth century. Uh, one to two hundred, uh, Tudor times seven, uh, War of the Roses. War of the Roses. Forgive me. I'm really bad at my world history. Anyway, so rounders is like, if they had just gone with rounders, it's a newer invention than cricket, but it's so much more similar to baseball. That's, but, Wow. That means that England kind of invented baseball. This is the most shocking fact that uh, I could have possibly learned today. Dang. Maybe maybe I don't have to hate them all the time after all. Just kidding. Um, what do you call it? Anglo... Ing Anglo... Anglophobia. <laughs> With an E instead of an A. <clears throat> you know how it is. You know how it is. No Fredophobia, though. Let's um check out Stool Ball. Do, do, do. Expand Stool Ball. Where's the rules? Okay. 
Okay, so stool ball might actually be more similar to rounders and as old as cricket. It's played on grass with 90-yard diameter boundary, and the pitch is 16 yards long. Each team consists of 11 players, one team fielding and other batting. Bowling is underarm from a bowling crease from the batter's wicket with the ball reaching the batter on the full, as in rounders or base, uh, excuse me, as in rounders or baseball rather than bouncing from the pitch, as in cricket. Okay. As it is played today, a bowler attempts to hit the wicket with the ball and the batter defends it using a bat shaped like a frying pan. The batter scores runs by running between the wickets or hitting the ball beyond the boundary in a similar way to cricket. A ball hit over the boundary counts for four runs if it has hit the ground before reaching the boundary, or six runs. So runs are like bases, and points are calculated in bases. Mm, okay, so the posts are like little uh, little boundary, little doggy doors that you have to hit over. Uh, originally, the batter simply had to defend her or his stool from each ball with a hand and would score a point for each delivery until the stool was hit. The game later evolved to include runs and bats. Huh. So the stools are what then? Uh, with the ball reaching the batter on the full. Each over consists of eight balls. The wicket itself is a square piece of wood at head or shoulder height fastened to a post. Traditionally, this was the seat of a stool hung from a post or tree. Some versions used a tall stool placed upright on the ground. What? What? What is the boundary? That's the thing that I don't understand. I think it's like a little wall or something that you hit. Anyway, that's stool ball. Uh, there's plenty more in this weird sports article to go around. For example, Mormons versus mullets? What the hell is that? I'm not even going to get into it. Because you know what? We got other things to talk about after I take a break and clear my throat. <clears> throat> <clears throat> Let me do that thing that I said. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Oh, wait, that's the wrong Italian opera. You can't cancel Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman never got canceled because... Uh, uh, canceling technology was something invented by the Clinton Foundation in 1994. And that's a joke about the Telecommunications Act. I'm just kidding. Um, we're going to do Sofia Coppola, director's filmography, tier lit, uh, dumb guys, director uh, filmography tier list and I can say that because I'm talking about myself and I've, I've, I've been I've seen behave, behavioral scientists about the, they they worked they worked for the DNC and the Clinton Foundation I'm not even kidding oh my god I am um, so I wanted to see what the deal with, was with Sophia Coppola, 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 because I'm a huge fan of Lost in Translation, uh, R.I.P. Bill Murray. He's not dead yet for before when he does die. <clears throat> that really sucks about Bill Murray. That sucks, man. Fall from grace. 
But I've seen that movie many a time, and I was wondering what other movies she directed. That is her second. All right. So we're going to go from S to uh, D here. And like I said, dumb, dumb guy tier list. I haven't seen most of these. So I'm just going to say, based on the trailers that I watched, Virgin Suicides, uh, God, it's been a while. It's been a while. Virgin Suicides B. I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the safe B tier. Incredible soundtrack. Of course, early on, she did a lot of music video directions, says here, including uh, Flaming Lips and uh, Kevin Shields as well. If I'm not mistaken, I think 1975 might be on the Marie Antoinette soundtrack, or is it a LCD sound system? It's something like that. It's something that sounds like that, and it's very interesting. Virgin Suicides B. Lost in Translation. Oh God. Oh God. S with a with an automatic cancellation reduction. Um, I'm getting a message here from uh damn the uh the Move On Foundation. <laughs> they say they say they want to um they want to overturn that that court case that made uh, lobbying legal or whatever. And also they're telling me that I have to cancel Bill Murray. Uh, what did Bill Murray do? Oh yeah, it was his own, it was his own wife. It's like, it's kind of sick. Uh, Marie Antoinette is the next one. And based on, based on what I'm seeing, we got, we got modern, we got modern rock and roll. Gliss glistening with bubbly poppy hi-fi goodness over uh what looks like uh some actress that is very Kirsten Dunst. Okay, yeah. Um and I think it's I think it's a real story about Marie Antoinette. I'm gonna go ahead and put that I'm gonna put that in the beat here. Cause it looks like a very decent movie. Um haven't seen it. Haven't seen the rest of these. <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna pretend like we have an opinion. Somewhere is the next one. And this one stars uh Steven Dorf and L Fanning. Ellie? Ellie Fanning? L Fanning? Damn. I don't even know how to pronounce that name. She was in I just recently learned uh this is a three degrees of separation situation. <clears throat> the voiceover for Miyazaki, Hayao Miyazaki, Spirited Away, which uh, gets a mention a little bit later. We're going to talk about uh, Godfather, of course. Somewhere was released in 2010, and it's about this guy who is like a washed up actor, I guess maybe similar to the character in Lost in Translation. <clears throat> He's just chilling at this uh, hotel. There seems to be a scene similar to when Bill Murray gets like some sort of a uh, woman of the night delivered to him and he's just not into it. Some... Uh, pole dancers just chilling in his room and he's got the thousand yard stare he's got the thousand yard stare he's just like what is going on a day or two later l fanning his uh his young daughter who who knows what the fuck is going on i'm actually watching the trailer on mute right now it's it seems like a tearjerker i'm gonna put that one in the a category um she she seems to be a highly respected actor, and it seems like a an oddly it seems like oddly a remnant of the Lost in Translation story, but without um maybe without the the Roman the infidelity 
maybe maybe Sofia Coppola was like, yeah, "There's there's infidelity in this, and I want to do the same thing again." I don't know. Maybe dock it. No, because I watched the trailer and it was damn near making me cry. Next is the Bling Ring in uh, 2013, and this is a movie um, with Emma Watson in it. And I think a dude named Israel Brosard. What was he in? He was in some horror movie. Um, this is schlocky as hell. This looks this looks actually kind of horrible. It's like Entourage or something. It seems to be. It seems to be about a group of like twenty uh, somethings like hanging out in. LA and trying to get like in with Paris Hilton or something. Let's put that one in the D tier. No, I mean, I want to say C minus. I want to say C minus, but just for, for gravity's effect, let's put it in the D tier. Schlock, pure schlock. Um, there seems to be some stuff that she made for Christian Dior. That's pretty interesting. Next in her director filmography is, I don't know how this works, but it's a stage production of La Triviata. Directors, Sofia Coppola and Fres Francesca Nessler. Maybe that's the straight stage direction. It's literally a play. Um, maybe there's some sort of... May, maybe it wasn't even filmed in front of a live audience. I'm so interested in that compared to the bling ring that I'll put it in the B tier. I'll put it in the B tier and I'll put it on my list of... Uh, "Quote unquote films, quote unquote films to watch." I find that interesting. Um, of course, it's a classic. Uh, what is the name of the guy? Verdi or something? Very old uh, opera, "The Beguiled." So we got a couple in the B tier here. The Beguiled is. The Beguiled is going to go in A, though. I don't know if I can quite say... Oh. Let me mute that. I don't know if I can quite say that this is an S-tier film. But... <clears throat> what I can say is that Colin Farrell is in it. And he's a wounded Union soldier who turns up at a girls' school. Um, the main gal in this is Nicole Kidman, who is like uh, in the uh, she's like the headmaster or something. So basically, Colin Farrell comes in. He's she tells him, you know, don't don't fuck with these girl these young girls. He starts fucking with these young girls. Um, it turns to a point of like sexual violence. And then something happens at the end and uh, dude is screaming bloody murder. They fuck him up and they're all they're all down to just torture the shit out of him. Cause you might be hot, but you can't just go around doing whatever you want, man. That's a A plus material right there. If if there's any of these that I haven't seen yet that I'm gonna watch besides Marie Antoinette, it's gotta be the Beguiled. <clears throat> Seems like almost like a psychological slasher movie. I don't know, like I don't really know if it goes into the gory details, but it seems like it has some violence that that deserves a little bit of retribution. On the Rocks has Rashida Jones, who I actually like quite a lot. It's got Bill Murray in his... Uh, dang, really? Bill Murray. That one's going to go 
in the D tier. The D stands for D triple C. Let's go though. We actually, you actually do need to vote though. I might, I go back and forth. I gotta vote. I gotta vote on this local shit. So that's it for all of that. Yeah. Oh, there's some Cartier stuff that she did too. She's working on the custom of the country and Priscilla. Look out for the custom of the country and Priscilla. Oh, there's a trailer out for Priscilla. Priscilla and Elvis Presley. Interesting. Very gray gardens. Very gray gardens. I like that. I like that a lot. Priscilla goes in the S tier, baby. S tier. We got Sofia Coppola's blonde up in this. That would be cool, though. It's Sofia Coppola's blonde. <laughs> it's a good title for the for the dang thing. So, Godfather Part One. We've got Sonny. We've got Michael. You know. Robert Duvall, when you search for uh, the Godfather, like a uh, friggin' film uh, cast or whatever, it's funny because Ro for some reason, Robert Duvall doesn't come up. And it's part of it is it Google, for some god awful reason, in the year 2023, Google, Google doesn't understand that when you're searching for the cast of Godfather 1, or Godfather Part One, or Godfather One spelled O N E, or P T abbreviated to P T dot. Any combination of these things, it's not going to understand that you don't want to. You don't want to hear about Fred Fredo. You know what I mean? I haven't gotten there yet. You hold your horses, and then for some reason. We've got Robert De Niro listed as a cast member with his goofy ass failed attempt at auditioning for this movie. And Robert Duvall as Tom Hagen, probably one of the best performances in this film, nowhere to be found. We got characters from part two, part three. I don't, I don't need to know about these, you know whatever so i don't know really what to say about godfather but i've got these uh what is it easter eggs or whatever the reason i got into the sofia coppola thing is because she's in all these movies she's the baby in the baptism that's one of these easter eggs one of the one of the little known things that you might not know <clears throat> I think th probably the most interesting thing is the Marlon Brando, um, what you call it, prosthetics? What do you call it? Cheek, cheek, cheek prosthetics? They're inside of his mouth and it like affects the way that he talks, kind of. But it was his idea to show up to the audition with cotton inside of his mouth. And they ended up making like special stuff. Um, so there's a lot of weird improvisation that goes into these, right? So what is it? The famous line, leave the gun, take the cannoli was improvised because there was an on the fly script edition um, where an early, an earlier scene in the film, Clemenza's wife says, don't forget the cannoli. That was like an edit that uh, that Coppola made on the fly. Um, this is sick. This is sick right here. They used a real horse head in the scene where uh, they send a message to the guy. They're sending a message to him that they're going to make an offer he can't refuse. If he doesn't comply, 
Um, so this is interesting. Uh, former pro wrestler Lenny Montana played Luca Brasi, and he was actually very uh, nervous to be shooting a scene with Marlon Brando, which is why he he sort of like stumbled through his lines in the scene where they're actually meeting. So what Coppola did, since he didn't have time to redo the scene with Brando for whatever reason, he added the scene earlier where Lenny Montana is, uh, as Luca Brasi is like sitting in the steps and like sort of uh, rehearsing his lines. Like it, it, he made the character himself nervous so that the take would make sense. And he was like, oh yeah, no, that's, that'll totally work. Um, Brando got the best actor for this and he turned it down as the second person to ever do this. And he said, of it, he said that it was because of the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry. It's very interesting. It's very interesting that he was very progressive on issues like the Black Panther Party. Very interesting. So he didn't stuff his mouth with cotton, but he did use a uh, a prosthetic that they made specially based on his cotton thing. Um, this is this is kind of weird. Uh, Don means a respected uncle. And this is the most interesting thing. I actually watched Robert De Niro do a screen test for this. Other other people included Warren Beatty, Dustin Hoffman, and Jack Nicholson as the part of Michael. Incredible, incredible. There's not I mean every I feel like everybody in the world had seen this movie up to the point where I saw it like last week. But what else is there to say about it? The famous mustache tree transition the mustache tree we've got um simonetta stefanelli uh very italian very beautiful looking woman um i don't know what her career was like after this but uh damn rest in peace rest in peace michael comes back and I don't know. They massacred my boy. Fucking take the cannoli. Uh, an offer he can't refuse. What's not to like about this? It's very Shakespearean. I felt like I was like watching um, The Wire at points in this. It's like, I feel like, I don't know if there's like some inspiration taken from this, but the way that they the way they do their business and the way they uphold a set of, uh, I don't know, call it, call it chauvinistic. <clears throat> There's an interesting fact about this film where there was like some Italian, Italian rights organization that was like, Oh, we can't, we can't have a, uh, we can't have the words mob or mafia in this movie. And the closest they came to it was they said something about the underworld in a newspaper article in the movie. So the N bomb, dear Lord with this film and Pulp Fiction, it's like, why was just white dudes like, like brazenly dropping the N bomb, like totally fly by night, like totally cool. I don't really, I don't really get it. It's pretty crazy. We can't, I, I'm not going to, I mean, I don't want to be fredophobic, you know, I can be, I can be ingolophobic, but you know, uh, there is something, there is something kind of insightful that tugs at my heartstrings that I can say about this film that, that in the days, I mean, it is Shakespearean. It is it's it's an epic that I'm only a third of the way through. I'm sure it's going to get a little bit less awesome as it as it goes. But uh, you know, there's also different different sequences in which you can 
watch them or whatever. I don't, there's different edits. I don't, I don't really know if there's cuts that, that I want to check out just for quote unquote filmic purposes. But, uh, the, the real tragedy of, uh, Michael in the Godfather part one is that he went out on that summer day and found the homeboy who was laying hands on his sister and said in front of like a hundred people with the children playing in the, the fire hydrant if you touch my sister again, I'll kill you. And when you become the boss of like the most, if not the second most infamous crime family in New York, you can't just go back on your word. So it sucks that there isn't just a, you know, John Brown like figure who's like trailblazing and fucking up motherfuckers who like put their hands on women to imagine the scene. She's so clearly pregnant and it's so disgusting. You want as someone who's like been living in this world for a couple hours of you motherfucker of, of I everyone has a fucking pistol while they're playing the piano or whatever. You're like, I want this guy dead, but the real tragedy. And I guess this is my final thought on the Godfather before we get to a real interesting and, and fun one. Sonatine, Sonatine, Sonatine. I still don't know how it's pronounced. Dude, don't, I'm sorry. It's too bad that the reason Michael kills that guy is because he said he would is because he has to stick to his reputation. He has to keep his reputation in line. That is the why of that guy is dead. It's not because of what he did. It's not because it's wrong to bring just because you think you're part of the fucking what's his name crime family <clears throat> this is how bad my uh, memory is the Corleone the Corleones the Corleones I'm just going to call them the Corleones from now on just because you think you're you're you know you're in with the Corleone family, you've got you're married to the you know you had this vicious motherfucker Don Corleone at your wedding. You got his daughter as your piece. You think you can bring women into this world of violence? You think that it's you think that it's okay? But no. Michael had to kill him to uphold his reputation and not not solely because it was the right thing to do. And I think you can see it in his eyes. I think Pacino does an, a brilliant job. You know, it's Scarface. I'm going to get to Scarface very soon, but uh he's got he's got a really much younger look in this film and I think honestly dare dare I say it, Al Pacino Kind of charming looking. Little he's he's kind of a handsome dude. I liked Robert Duvall in this. He's very uh seems like the only guy with a good head on his shoulders in this in this in this film. I think his performance is really good, but damn Pacino. You can almost see in his eyes that uh he wants to be that feminist John Brown. He 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 doesn't want the guy to live, but he doesn't want the reason for killing him to be. Oh, I'm Corley. I'm Don Corleone. I I gotta do what I gotta do. It's the code. 
the code should be we have this world of violence so we don't bring women i don't know and so uh sophia coppola <clears throat> shout outs we'll put that on the list of things to cover on in the future in the podcast as well scarface pacino sophia uh the banished or whatever it's freaking called uh feminist gore movie uh i'm excited to talk about sonatine um jim o'rourke uh miyazaki tarantino so so much goes into this conversation um that is uh pretend it's like a very it's almost a goofy movie but it's fun uh after the break year is 1990 something you're in an abandoned office building in okinawa uh flash forward you're in a tea room with six or seven very old men and they have girls with them um you've been sent on a job uh, weird marimbas start playing. Flash forward, you're sumo wrestling on the beach and getting into a, various tickle fights, shenanigans involving Russian roulette. It's Sonatine, baby. Sonatine? I feel like it's got to be Sonatine if it's Japanese. Correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> um, Takeshi Kitano, star of Battle Royale. Battle Royale is a movie that has come up once or twice. I'm not sure if he directed it. He certainly starred in it. He wrote, directed, starred in this movie. It's so crazy. It's so crazy good. What I'm realizing now is that maybe with this in Battle Royale, especially Battle Royale, I mean, the connection is very obvious. Maybe the Squid Game series never came, never comes to be. Um, and this is something else I am so intrigued by with, I think, the Better Call Saul series has in the first season or two, it shows all of these guys who are part of like the criminal underworld. This is what I like. It's field day type stuff. It's like leisure activities, but done by people who are like dangerous crime men. It's like noir, but, uh, but you're playing badminton for some, it's like campy noir. Camp, maybe it's campy noir. Camp is something we recently spoke about too, and watching Friday the Thirteenth, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, all that. Uh, of course, I'm a big fan of home movies. That was the best example of camp that I could come up with, because that's like almost meta camp. You got a cartoon, or you're trying to get these. You're trying to make it look like eight year olds are making a. <laughs> eight-year-olds who talk like they're 22 for some reason are making films in their garage and everything's made out of cardboard they gradually get more professional in production value or whatever <clears throat> great stuff but this is a very campy movie um so it was one of the things that inspired quentin tarantino i haven't seen reservoir dogs it's the it's probably the only early Tarantino movie that I haven't seen. Uh but I you can feel the reservoir dogs in this movie a little bit. The way that it's uh th there's very interesting outfits and very like brutal realism. Um the the sort of themes of like the tone on this movie it's just like pasted over and slathered with 
brutal realism, thousand yard stairs, you know, a, a just insane acts of violence, you know. I was looking here because the other things that were listed in an article about Tarantino's inspirations were, uh, of course, Battle Royale and Akira Kurosawa. For some reason, I thought there was a connection between the other Kurosawa, Kiyoshi Kurosawa, um, director of Sweet Home, Pulse, Cure, a very experimental horror director that I'm looking into getting into. The only connection I could find is that Jim O'Rourke was talking about him in this uh, this magazine called Bomb, and he did he did an interview with Kurosawa where he was like, "Oh, well, I was getting into, you know, um, I was into uh, Takeshi Kitano." Uh, who I think I don't really know much about this dude, but I think he does like comedy stuff too. Uh, maybe uh, God Lockstock, two smoking barrels. What was his name? Guy, the Guy Ritchie type character of Japan. Um, Sonatine is not that funny. It's not that funny unless you're like. Unless you're like a really sick person, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, it's set in Tokyo in the 90s. Basically, the plot... Um, this is this is a movie that you don't want to know too much about the ending. And even though it is a, an old movie, um, either either stop the episode now and go check it out. Or, uh, or uh, I, I'm actually not going to spoil all of it so there's that too we've got An anakin murakawa <laughs> his name is aniki murakawa of the murakawa clan uh yakuza a yakuza boss he's sent by his boss from tokyo to okinawa to settle what he says is a gang war going on between these two clans called the Nakam Nakamatsu and Anan clans. Uh, they were allies. There was some very small dispute, like a stabbing or something. Um, Murakawa was sent down there, and, you know, it's, it's interesting that Maybe this movie couldn't have been made in an age where telecoms have come so far, but there seems to be a lack of information going on in what is a, you know, what they su suspect to be a double crossing. They already know even before they get there, uh, Murakawa and his right hand man, Ken, something fishy is up and something fishy indeed is up. There's a uh, a bombing that goes down, and then they they go, oh, this is full scale war. Now it was just like, you know, really bad uh, political intrigue before, but it's clear it's clear now that somebody wants someone dead. So we're gonna go, <laughs> and this I swear to God is the best part of the entire movie for some god awful reason. There's a woman who. Um, ends up in the place where they're staring, staying out off the beaten path on the seaside, which is a kind of like a beachside house that's owned by one of the, one of the rival clans brothers. And he's like, Oh, it's empty. We can use this. They hang out there for a while. They're running out of water. They got to wait for, for like for rain to come to shower because one of the guys is being an asshole. This girl ends up there because she's abducted and Murakawa responds by just immediately killing the guy who brought her there, who's like trying to take advantage. And they have like a budding romance going on after that. Cause he's like, yo, I just like, <laughs> and it's very funny the the difference between the Godfather and here is that the, the femme fatale lady, the, the lady role 
in this, she just like comes straight out and says it. She's like, Hey, I think it's hot when you kill people. She, there's some line in there where she's like, so when was the first time you killed someone? <laughs> and he's like, I killed my dad when I was like 11. And she's like, that's so cool. I think you're so charming. <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that it's like it's very interesting but they're all having fun together and this scene happens where they're like they do sumo wrestling they're just like doing random games on the beach while they hide out and wait they literally don't know what's going on some of them already know that uh their boss is just like fucking with them they don't know really how bad it is until shit hits the fan later and a, a bunch of people die ken ends up dying and in what is like maybe the most dramatic part another great scene they're just driving and driving down this old country road until they get to a cliff so they can throw his body away because they can't have you know they're all in the underworld this is a different this is a different level of illegality where they have these real ass guns those aren't legal i don't think in tokyo at this time so even like knives and stuff homemade guns are going around there's a stabbing that happens in one of these office buildings it's, it's that is that is one humorous part of the movie where this kid sca- stabs the other guy and then later they're on a bus together because they gotta they gotta go to their location and he's like you did you want some like snacks that they provided for us and he's like you stabbed me and it still hurts. I can't eat. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but there's this other guy who befriends Ken before he dies. And uh, <clears throat> great line of dialogue. Uh, the kid's name is Ryoji. And he lasts. He's he's a smart guy. He lasts a while in this movie. Um he's got a cool outfit the whole way he's wearing these shorts and these boat shoes he's kind of he's kind of handsome too but uh him and ken are hanging out before ken dies and he's like you know he's like this young gangbanger and ken is like you know the right hand man of like the the dawn that was just sent down to them and he's like hey do you know my friend uh kinojo of nakano he barricaded himself in a market after he robbed it. <laughs> and he's like, no, I don't, I don't know. Ken goes, I don't know. No. What? What about Nanbara? He's a gang writer. <laughs> and Ken responds by going, don't you have any decent friends? Like someone who's like famous in high school sports or something. <laughs> so there's this, there's this idea and another earlier line of dialogue where I think, uh, Murakawa says to Ken, I'm thinking about retiring. These guys are so they they're on a level where they're like all of this. Speaking of irony poisoning, they're poisoned by uh, they're poisoned by the black pill or something. Anyway, they recognize that all of this violence around them, all this weird all this weird bullshit retribution gang war stuff is just nonsense you know he's like what are these kids doing like why are we what is what even is this you know but yeah the music both in the uh in the sumo wrestling scene incredible just super incredible they're playing games with cards and then it goes out there and they're like they're not like tickling each other but there's like there's a funny thing where they're like performatively doing um sumo wrestling and like carrying each other they're actually competing at one point but then uh i don't know they're like pretending to do like free it's like a game of freeze tag all of a sudden it almost seems like the actors like improvised and then it, the speed of it changes and everything so not to uh yeah just some just some great moments both musically and dialogue speaking <clears throat> Uh, another early thing where there there's like a rival guy that comes to Tokyo before they leave and they end up just like torturing him to death by like putting him on a crane and like putting him underneath the water in this nearby lake and Murakawa goes oh shit we killed him 
<laughs> it's like part of him is just just mindlessly violent and part of him is just like these dang kids and their violence that's i guess that's more ken ken is just like they're so done with it they've been uh they've been drafted into this world and they're they're resigned to their fate and they don't like it <clears throat> they beat up this other guy before leaving and then long story short yeah it all comes to blows when they try and find the uh one of these rival guys from the Anon clan in the uh the hotel that he's staying at and when when they were hanging out at the beach house there was a hired gun this dude that was like uh disguised as a fisherman was like hanging out in the shadows and he ended up killing a couple of them or something. It all comes to blows when he recognizes the dude randomly in an elevator on his way out. And he goes, pow, pow, pow. And for some reason, the guy, the fisherman assassin guy is also in that elevator. And like everybody dies except like those two or something. And, uh, Yep, a couple more people die. Murakawa gets his vengeance after after he realizes what happens. And then after that, it's pure question marks. I can't reveal too much about the ending of this movie. It's uh it's romantic. It's unforgettable. But you got to see it uh if you haven't seen it yet. It's a lot more popular than I thought it was uh, going into this. It's got music. Oh, yeah. I mentioned how great the music was. That That is uh, Joe Hisaishi, who did uh, all of the Miyazaki films and Nino Kuni, which is a Japanese RPG that is, I think, much newer. It has like an action turn-based slash action style. I've, I've seen some stuff, some gameplay of it. And this guy as a music composer makes me want to play it, but I've got, I've got so many games on my list. I've got so many games on my list. I'm working on getting new uh, television equipment because mine is crapping out on me. So I've been playing games like I usually do. Um, There'll be more content about that on the show. I'll do my uh, Heather Ann Campbell as the Resident Evil 3 merchant. What are you playing? And I'll tell you guys about what I'm playing after I get this 8 Bido controller going and new TVs going. I am resigned to PS1 and PS2 games on a plasma screen from like 2003 right now which is very funny it looks horrible but it's fun that's it for the episode uh i didn't mention up front but i told myself a million times to do this check out the patreon we are putting up some new comics and we are writing and producing new ones these are comic strips so if you're expecting to see a whole sprawling narrative of stuff wait for fiasco continuously recording worlds which will be part of this podcast that's right i am announcing it officially work has begun on a radio play a whole ass uh whole ass thing that i'm going to produce entirely by myself in little chunks and that'll be your bonus content for now Check out my visual art, my little funnies on patreon.com slash friendship emulator. Like and subscribe to our podcast. Uh, find Friendship Emu on Twitter. And with that, have a very pleasant day. Uh, next week is going to be... Do, 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 what is it? Uh, Valerie and her week of wonders and all about Lily Chocho. Finally, we're doing it and it's going to be real fun. 
See you next time. Bye.